Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, Sam Kareem and I this afternoon for a property affairs uh, case law update. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Faye Collinson, barrister and mediator uh, at King's Chambers. As I say, we have a case law update for you today. It's split into two parts. I'm dealing with the first part, and I'm going to give uh, an overview of uh, a few cases, not all of which are decisions of the Court of Protection. Uh, there are decisions from uh, the Business Property Court, uh, and also there's a clinical negligence case in there too. Uh, but in my view, all of them are relevant to those of you who are practicing in Property Affairs Court of Protection and also Health and Welfare Matters. Those of you who have of deputies uh, and also those of you who uh, practice in Wills Trust and Probate. Sam um, is going to join us shortly. He's just stuck in court, hence for the uh, slightly late start, for which I apologise. Uh, and he's going to be dealing with uh, cross-border management of P's estate and when P wants to leave the jurisdiction. Um, it's quite infrequent for us to hold a property affairs case law update, and that's because Whilst property and affairs makes up, as Mr. Justice Hayden says in one of the cases to which I'm going to refer to today, the vast majority of the work in the Court of Protection, the decisions that it produces are actually quite infrequent. Um, but this year, um, and, and a little bit of 2022, has actually produced um, more cases in the property and affairs jurisdiction than it usually would do. The webinar is recorded as usual, so um, what we'll do is we'll email around the recording afterwards, so feel free to send that on to your colleagues. We also put it up on the YouTube channel as well, uh, and as usual, I will um, send around the slides after the seminar. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function. I'll try my best to answer those if I can. Um, failing that, uh, my email is there, um, and so do feel free. Uh, to email me. So the first case that I'm going to discuss with you is the case of F and R. Now this is a decision from the last part of 2022 and it's a decision of Her Honour Judge Hilda. Um, the application was brought by uh, P's father who was also his property affairs deputy in the application, the deputy sought authority to execute a deed settling R's inheritance into a disabled person's trust. Just pausing there, um, many of you will know what a disabled person's trust is. Um, some of you may not know that. It's a mechanism uh, by which um, usually inheritance is uh, settled into a trust of that nature and it attracts with it certain tax advantages uh, for the disabled person. And ordinarily, uh, it will be established as a discretionary trust as long as the disabled person is the primary beneficiary. And if it complies with the requirements for a disabled person's trust and you make an election at HMRC, um, then you can have those uh, particular uh, tax benefits. But also, if it's settled usually as a discretionary trust, um, then ordinarily it will preserve P's entitlement to means tested benefits, which is usually quite important for individuals who do qualify for a disabled person's trust. So in this case, R, who I think was a young man, had an income of about £60,000 a year, most of that, I think in fact all of that derived from benefits, but the majority of that uh, income benefits was means tested benefits. His uncle, I think, um, was his deceased relative, and he made a will uh, in which he gave R a one third of the residuary estate. So he had an absolute interest in the residue which by the time of the hearing, it hadn't crystallized, but it was expected to be uh, around the value of 400 to 600,000 pounds. The problem with the proposal is that the local authority or the DWP were probably going to consider settlement of the inheritance. 
into a disabled person's trust to be a deprivation of assets. Many of you will be uh, aware of that legislation under the CARE Act and under the income support regulations. In the application, it, it doesn't appear that the DWP or the local authority had actually been asked the question uh, whether if the money were settled into the trust, uh, would those authorities take the view that there had been a deprivation of assets? And of course, if a local authority or the DWP does take that view, then it can still treat the capital that's settled into the trust as notional capital. So it can cause real problems uh, for individuals like R and others. So the key question, as it as it all often is in application of this nature, is whether it was in R's best interest to authorise the settlement of his inheritance into the disabled person's trust. And central to that was the court's consideration of, of the chances, realistically, of that being considered a deprivation of uh, assets. Because the court is making a decision on behalf of P in making the settlement. And so Judge Hilda was concerned to consider what the court's intention was in acceding to the application. And so the central issue in the application was whether a significant operative purpose of the settlement was to preserve our entitlement to means-tested benefits. The competing uh, arguments uh, were as follows. Um, Father and Deputy argued that even though it may have the appearance of wanting to preserve means-tested benefits, was actually the focus of the application of the true intention is to better affect the deceased's intention. Um, I find that quite um, uh, an unconvincing argument, I have to say, um, but um, ingenious at the same time. And so effectively, it was being said that when the uncle goes to his solicitor to get the will drafted, that he was concerned that the structure of the will um, was such that R would actually receive his inheritance. And so much of the application, it seems, focused around consideration of the will file and looking at the attendance notes to see what the deceased's uh, intention was in making the will in the terms that he did. On the opposite side was the official solicitor representing R. She opposed the application, which to me was an unsurprising stance for her to take. The primary position that uh, was taken by the official sister was that there was a clear risk that the relevant authorities would take the view that the proposed settlement was probably going to be a deprivation of capital and that that in turn exposed R to unnecessary risk because then there would have to be uh, an attempt to unwind any trust and potentially leave R um, in a less uh, or more prejudicial financial position. What well, they always said that if there were a way in which R's inheritance could be placed into the trust structure without compromising his entitled entitlement to benefits, then that would be uh, a position that she would agree to. But looking at the relevant um, legislation, the official sister came to the view that on balance, the DWP and local authority probably would consider it to be uh, a deprivation of assets. Another argument that was also advanced by the official solicitor is that there were disadvantages in having a trust structure. At the time of the application, R's money was managed by his father and deputy. So the starting point was that the deputy was entitled to manage the inheritance derived from the residuary state when that came into uh, effect. And settling a trust would move R's assets to trustees from the deputy. And with that came uh, less supervision. And so the official solicitor said that that uh, situation wasn't in P's best interest. Judge Hilda agreed with the official solicitor, she rejected the application. Having considered the will file, uh, Judge Hilda found that whilst the deceased had considered the possibility of some form of trust arrangement in which to hold R's inheritance, um, they had or he had actually decided expressly 
to give our an absolute interest in the residue. And there was comment in the judgment about our father saying that he had had a specific conversation with the uncle about trust arrangement. So Hilda was saying, even though he was told that, he still went on nevertheless to give him an absolute interest in the residuary estate. And Judge Hilda also agreed with the official solicitor that the structure of a trust has real disadvantages to R when compared with the deputyship. And um, that is um, a view that is taken by many court of protection judges, uh, particularly when an individual has a large personal injury or clinical negligence award and the um, court approving the settlement is thinking about trust versus deputy ship, the downsides of a trust arrangement are that there is much less supervision because it's you don't have the OPG. There is limited supervision from the High Court and the inherent jurisdiction and other uh, statutory arrangements. But I think more importantly, there's no security bond, uh, which there, are, of course, is with the deputy ship. And Judge Hilder also said, there's no guarantee that the application was going to work. Um, nobody had asked the DWP or the local authority the question whether it would consider that settling the monies was going to be a deprivation of assets. Uh, and that there was a clear risk, Judge Hilder said, that they would see that the preservation of means tested benefits entitlement was the, the sole or the significant operative purpose in making that arrangement. And the court was not there to endorse such a proposal. The decision act doesn't, to me, seem a surprising one, uh, but I draw your attention to a decision of LMS in 2020, which some of you may be aware of, which comes to a different view, one might say. I noticed that counsel for the applicant in both cases was the same, and the same argument seems to have been put forward in LMS, namely that the test data was their real intention to ensure that um, P got their hands on their inheritance rather than it being used uh, to replace their means test of benefit. LMS was decided by District Judge Beckley, and one of the key reasons for approving the settlement, uh, or the settlement in that case, was that the judge found as a fact that it would better affect the testator's intention. Um, in FNR, Judge Hilda found that that decision, of course, was not binding on her. So. I think I just flag that up because just be careful how much reliance you place on the LMS decision if you do ever have um, a case uh, like this. So we've got EG and DG. I'm not going to go through this because it's a, a case in which uh, I appeared this year. I've already uh, held a seminar on it and we do have a YouTube video um, of this seminar um, on whichever channel it we, we use. Um, but it is, if you are not aware of it, an important decision. And I just flag up there the, the three learning points from that case. The first and one of the key ones is about the extent of the Court of Protection's jurisdiction to determine issues affecting P's estate. Judge Hilda makes it abundantly clear in this decision that the Court of Protection does not have the power to determine disputes or the rights of third parties or P. And one of the classic examples that the COP I found historically has been asked to determine are property disputes. And in EG, there was a dispute about whether P had a beneficial interest in a property. And Judge Hilda said, it, that is a matter for the civil court to determine, not the court of protection. The second learning point is that the COP can grant uh, an injunction in the property and affairs uh, jurisdiction, but those injunctions can only be granted where they're used to ensure compliance with the best interest decision. Uh, so um, one of the examples is where a deputy is discharged and a replacement deputy appointed in their place, there is the usual order that requires the uh, discharged deputy to hand over all piece property, papers, etc. If there were, for whatever reason, a refusal to do that, the COP, I think, could probably use its injunctive powers 
to compel the discharging uh, deputy to hand those documents over. And the third and final point is about dispute resolution hearings. As far as I'm aware, EG is the first case where there's been any form of guidance on dispute resolution hearings. And many of you who are um, involved in contentious property and affairs uh, litigation will know that they are uh, increasingly common, that they're required by the practice direction. And you may have seen that sometimes uh, the courts will list multiple DRHs. What Judge Hilda may explain is that there should be only one DRH. All the parties and the court have only got uh, one bite of the cherry to try and get the settlement. If for whatever reason it doesn't result in that settlement, then the court should be giving directions to uh, a final hearing. But the third case is the Public Guardian severance applications. This is a decision of uh, Mr. Justice uh, Hayden from a few weeks ago. I'm sure many of you will have already read uh, this judgment because it's so important to those of you, particularly dealing with non-contentious wills, trust and probate cases. Uh, but the genesis of the decision was an application brought by the Office of the Public Guardian, which involved nine consolidated cases. And the issues that arose, or the questions that the OPG posed to Mr. Justice Hayden were so common that the OPG felt compelled to bring this application. And at the heart of it were interpretative questions about the 2005 Act uh, and the lasting power of attorney uh, regulations. So what I've done here over the next through, um, few slides, rather than going through the decision uh, bit by bit, is really just try to condense it down into three types of questions uh, or three headlines that were being asked um, of the judge. The first issue um, was, can uh, a donor have a lead attorney? And the answer to that was, no, uh, a donor cannot have a lead attorneys. And Mr. Justice Hayden said that attorneys who are, <laughs> excuse me, appointed to act jointly and severally must do so equally. And one attorney cannot act as a primary attorney. Any clause purporting to appoint on that basis is going to have to be severed. And that is what the OPG uh, have been doing. Not only that, the LPA instrument cannot uh, limit or restrict joint and several attorneys to a specific role or a specific remit. And the examples provided in the judgment were uh, an LPA that said an attorney was, con one attorney was concerned with business affairs, whereas my other attorney is concerned with my personal affairs. Mr. Justice Hayden said that the strict interpretation of uh, Section 10 of the 2005 Act did not permit that. And there was no basis to um, rewrite uh, that section. Uh, what he did say, however, is that it is open, of course, to a donor if they wish to demarcate their affairs in that way to create two LPAs that can complement one another. The second issue was can attorneys act with a majority and again, the answer to this was no, attorneys cannot act on a majority basis. The court considered that there would be some flexibility in offering that, and that would be quite an empowering um, way for, for the donor to deal with matters. But again, looking at the statutory interpretation of Section 10, which Mr. Justice Hayden said um, was quite tight in its drafting, the ordinary and natural meaning of that section did not permit attorneys to act on a majority basis. And so again, uh, the court um, said that the public guardian's approach in bringing severance applications in those circumstances uh, was to continue. And third and finally, the question was, can a donor replace a replacement attorney? The answer to this is in the affirmative, yes, they can. The donor is entitled to choose an attorney to replace a replacement attorney. Here, rather than giving um, the order in natural meaning uh, interpretation to the words, the judge adopted a purpose of interpretation of section 10.8b and concluded that supported the rationale of promoting 
at self-governance. And just um, a warning here about the decision of re Boff, which is the decision of senior judge Lush. Um, Hayden and Jay effectively disapprove that decision, uh, considering that in coming to the conclusion that the judge did, that there was too much focus on pre-legislative material. So the guiding principles on these issues are, of course, Mr. Justice Hayden's decision. The next case, I'm sure many of you will have heard of this because it's had quite some traction uh, on the uh, internet, is Brassington and Knights Professional Services. And again, uh, this is a matter uh, in which Sam, um, my colleague, uh, Neil Barrigan, appeared in. This isn't a court of protection decision, but it's a decision of Mr. Uh, of His Honour Judge Hodge KC, who is sitting in the Business and Property Court in Manchester. The judgment arose out of a summary judgment application rather than a substantive final hearing where the court hears uh, evidence from both parties. The facts of this are quite, um, well, surprising, really. Um, I think many people were surprised that this case was litigated. But at the heart of the case was Catherine Brassington, who was a former employee of Knight's. And she acted uh, as a solicitor and a professional deputy in the course of her employment for that firm. While she uh, was there for, I think, about six years, previously she had been at Slater and Gordon, uh, according to the judgment. And whilst uh, prior to her being there, there was a suggestion that Knights had always recovered its whip uh, entirely um, on assessment at the SCCO. Um, during these six years, on average, I think they were uh, recovering about 68% of the whip on each file and the consequence of that was that an amount outstanding in the sum of around about 166,000 uh, was still on the file. During these six years that this whip or unpaid whip was accumulating, according to the judgment, nothing was said. There was no approach by Knights to Miss Brassington to say, are you going to pay this or anything like that? Then, for reasons that are uh, unknown from the judgment, Miss Brassington resigns from Knights. And at that point, Knights threatened to exercise a lien uh, over her deputyship files unless the unpaid whip is paid. Quite remarkable, really, uh, that a firm would do that to uh, a former employee. But that prompted Miss Brassington to bring a parte claim seeking a declaration that she was not personally liable for the time recorded on the file, which could not be properly billed uh, to P. The focus of the application or the Part 8 claim was the retainer letter, and in particular, this clause 4.3. And Knights relied on the terms of Miss Brassington's standard deficit retainer letter as amounting to her being the client in her personal capacity rather than her capacity as a deputy and agreeing to take on personal liability for the uh, unpaid whip. So this is the clause that they uh, relied on. I don't know how this compares to any of your uh, retainer letters, but the, the key to it was <laughs> what's the true construction of the engagement letter. So what's what's the true meaning of it? Because letters are all drafted differently and the intention of contracting parties will change. So the questions that the court had to ask was, was Miss Bressington engaging Knights as an agent on behalf of P alone? Or was she contracting personally with Knights, either in place of or as well as P? And I imagine that the suggestion of the latter would fill most deputies uh, with horror. I've summarised here the court's decision. The judge had no hesitation whatsoever in concluding that Miss Brassington was contracting solely as agent uh, for P in each case. 
there was some criticism of the drafting of the retainer letter. The judge said that it was not an apt document to govern the retainer of a copper appointed deputy. And the specific example that was given was that one of the terms uh, required invoices to be sent out monthly, uh, contrasted with the practice direction that requires uh, quarterly, I understand. But the court went on to say that notwithstanding what Clause 4.3 said, both parties understood and were clear in their mind that P, rather than Miss Brassington, the deputy, was Knight's true client. And the letter also said we, as in Knight's, will act on your behalf as professional deputy for P. I mean, to me, that makes it abundantly clear, uh, the basis of that retainer. It also, the judge also remarked that Clark Clause 4.3 was a sort of standard term that Knights had included in its standard retainer with, with other clients outside the court of protection jurisdiction. And so that it had no application, even though it was in there, to the engagement in question. But that the work being carried out by Knights uh, was clearly for P's benefit, not for Miss Bressington's. And with that brought a recognition on both sides that Knights owed P contractual duties and also tortious duties. And also the court considered the drafting of the letter against the context of the statutory regime in which Miss Bressington was appointed, which under section 19 makes it clear is as an agent. Not only that, Miss Brassington and some of her co-family deputies were never told by Knights that they were personally liable for the whip. And as I said at the outset, <coughs> during the six years, Knights never drew to Miss Brassington's attention that the unmilled whip was mounting up and there was an expectation that she would have to pay it. One thing I think deserves some attention in this is that is this at the bottom, where the judge says, the terms of any contract signed by the deputy, its nature and its surrounding circumstances will have to be scrutinised carefully to determine whether the deputy is there for assuming any personal liability. Whilst this judgment is obviously a welcome judgment uh, and there would have been um, some serious concern if the decision had gone the other way, uh, I think it does have to be remembered that this judgment concerned the specific drafting of this specific retainer letter. And so it does not discern uh, a principle necessary that is applicable to every single retainer letter because each one will differ and the drafting will differ. And what I think the judge is saying here is that each contract has to be taken on its own facts. And so even though in this case there was no personal liability, it doesn't mean that other drafting wouldn't bring about a different conclusion. Uh, and then finally, um, this is the clinical negligence case again. Um, one of my colleagues, Sarah Pritchard, appeared in this matter. It was in front of Mr. Justice Ritchie. Uh, it concerned a kind of clinical negligence claim in which liability was admitted. And it concerned a trial of the damages claim for uh, a minor who suffered from cerebral palsy. I just wanted to draw this to your attention. Some of you may have seen <coughs> that um, the uh, PDF actually posted on their LinkedIn, I think it was last Friday, about this case just as a warning. So I thought I'd reiterate that warning because some of the findings of the judge about the deputy um, are, um, well, the, what might make one cringe when they, when they read the judgment, but there was one might say a light touch by the professional deputy are on this file. And there are two paragraphs that I just wish to highlight. Paragraph 72, and then I think it's 152 on the next slide. And the judge said at the end of his IE, the deputy's evidence, he accepted that he was not a court of protection approved deputy. Just pausing that, I, th I think that must be referring to a panel deputy because of course all deputies are effectively approved by the cops, they're appointed by them. He was a deputy for only three or four active cases and had never previously been a deputy for a catastrophic case of this size. Most of his work involved wills and probation trusts. He'd never handled a CP, cerebral palsy case before. 
be asserted that he thought that he was an appropriate deputy for the claimant. The judge then went on at paragraph 152 to say the deputy should have required a full qualified and experienced case manager. However, he himself was utterly inexperienced in CP deputy work. So you can see some uh, fairly cutting remarks from Mr. Justice Ritchie of this particular deputy. Uh, and I suppose it just serves as a very stark reminder that there are uh, deputies with different types of expertise. Uh, and it's a warning that really those ex complex, catastrophic cases ought to be the preserve of those deputies who are uh, experienced in those types of, of cases. So that's it from me. Uh, I think I can see Sam's... Here he is. Thanks very much, Fakes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I just wanted to give um, a brief... A brief a uh, two case update on um, on two issues in relation to deputies, property and affairs deputies. First of all, in relation to cross border and uh, cross border management of P's estate or assets, um, and when two jurisdictions can have concurrent responsibilities, so this country and another country can have concurrent responsibilities. So when that arises, number one. The second is a deputy's role in deciding whether or not P, um, uh, what, whether it's in P's best interest to leave this jurisdiction uh, and move to another. So the first case that I wanted to refer to was a case of called Potter's Rees Dolan Corporation Trust Limited uh, against WL and ML by the official solicitor, his litigation friend. And the citation for that is 2003 EW COP 19, a, a decision before senior judge Hilda, who we've heard um, much about this afternoon already in some cases that Faye's referred to. But this case really concerned the management of funds awarded by way of damages in a personal injury case that arose uh, out of uh, an accident many, many years ago when P was habitually resident at the time in the United Kingdom. Um, so he he was in the UK. There was an accident which resulted in an ac um, in an injury, which then resulted in him lacking capacity to make decisions about his property and affairs. The compensation was managed by um, by a, a deputy, uh, and that deputy was plainly Potter's Reeds Dolan's Corporation Trust Limited, um, and they were established or appointed after the PA PI settlement um, was established. His mother, who was WN in the proceedings sought an order after the property and affairs deputy was appointed in this jurisdiction from the Polish court to be his um, Polish guardian, as has been, uh, has been known and is recited in the judgment. Um, after getting that order successfully from the Polish courts, being his guardian under Polish law, she then sought to discharge Potter's Reeds Dolan Corporation Trust in favour of her order um, that she got from Poland, so an application for recognition of a protective order. Now the case has a, a real tangled procedural history, and that's honest, or, 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 and I can't emphasize it's more a real understatement. But and a large of it been caused by uh, a lawyer appointed by the Polish Guardian during some parts of those proceedings, but ultimately. The Polish Guardian withdrew her application to discharge the deputy, uh, conceding, I think, um, um, because of difficulties with the application itself. And it's worth looking in particular at paragraphs 35 and 36. Um, and this is a, a case where I acted for the deputy. But now, those paragraphs um, um, say the following things. First of all, that the Polish Guardian accepted that this this court, uh, uh, which is the, obviously the Court of Protection England, had jurisdiction over um, P's assets that he held in this country, and that's in regard to paragraph seven, subparagraph B of Schedule Three, and, it, and that's obviously contained in paragraph seven of the Mental Capacity Act. Um, so essentially, what that means is that the Court of Protection has jurisdiction over his property in England and Wales. Uh, and therefore, his damages award, which arose out of the PI settlement, um, was, was something which the court had jurisdiction over, 
But since at the time he was habitually resident in Poland, so because he moved to Poland after a period of rehabilitation and was not physically present in this jurisdiction and didn't need any urgent protection, the Court of Protection didn't have any jurisdiction on his welfare. So it covered his assets in this jurisdiction, but not in respect of his welfare. And his welfare was governed by the jurisdiction of Poland under the Polish guardianship order. So the parties accepted, amongst other things, together that the Polish orders, the guardianship order, um, in respect of P, was a protective measure. Um, protective measure being a definition under Schedule Three of the Act, um, under the International Protection of Adults. Um, it, it accepted that the recognition and enforcement uh, in England and Wales uh, of such measure was governed by Part Four of Schedule Three, um, and that. That recognition decision, and what I mean by that is that the court deciding whether or not it is, um, it should recognize and enforce that protective measure is not a best interest decision. That's clearly been laid out in previous case law, in particular, case of MN of 2010. Um, and, and if you want that citation, just email me and I'll provide it to you. But, and this is a critical point. There are limited circumstances in which recognition may be refused by the court of protection, uh, and those are set out um, very clearly, I would say, in paragraphs 19.3 and 19.4 of that schedule. And what 19.3 um, and 4 essentially say is that um, if there's been an omission of an opportunity to be heard by P in relation to that protective order, which could amount to a breach of natural justice, or if there's an inconsistency with a measure which is subsequently taken by the uh, uh, by the court in England and Wales, and I'm not going to concentrate on the last bit, I'll just concentrate on the first bit. So an omission of an opportunity to be heard amount to natural justice relating to the protective order that's seeking to be enforced, then the court may refuse to recognize um, that order. So there was a real question in this application as to whether P was involved in that process because uh, under Polish law, there is and procedural rule requirements, no requirement for P to be, uh, uh, to be heard in an application where you are, where somebody is seeking to be appointed his or her guardian. And so there was a real question as to whether there was a breach of natural justice and ergo whether the court should recognize it or not. And so it's for that reason I would suggest that the uh, that the Polish Guardian accepted um, the situation, and as a result of that, withdrew her application to uh, recognise and enforce that order, and to um, uh, dismiss um, the, the the deputy in the proceedings. So um, the result of it all was um, w w was this: that ultimately, Senior Judge Hilda broadly endorsed a compromise agreement between the parties as to how particular parts of P's life, P's life should be managed. Um, and that led to the finite detail which is included in the judgment, including uh, the provision of a monthly float, an expense system, the purchase of property in Poland to meet P's needs, uh, and so forth. Um, but, but obviously allowing for his welfare considerations to be purely under the responsibility of the Polish guardian who obviously happened to be his mother in those circumstances. So in a nutshell, um, it, answering, asking the question, is it possible to have cross-management of P's assets between different jurisdiction? It is possible. It's not ideal. Um, and um, it, 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 that kind of management is possible, especially when there's personal injury awards being made. Um, but, are, but they are extremely complex. And whilst this judgment provides a an example of how it can be done. They are intensely fact specific. Um, and it's helpful in confirming this judgment that there may be, uh, as there has been, some place for maintenance of a dual framework to secure the interests of the person. Because what Senior Judge Hilda went on to say when endorsing the proposal or having that concurrent liability at paragraph 55 was this that there is a degree of comp complexity inherent in maintaining dual management systems. But in this matter specifically, I'm satisfied that any disadvantages in that complexities are outweighed by the advantages of addressing best interests concerns 
which have arisen, and those best interest concerns related to the management and the Polish Guardian's ability to manage um, those finances properly. So that's a good example, uh, I would uh, I would say, of a case where concurrent liability across border is possible. It's not ideal, but it is possible. And a good example of how the court uh, looked at um, the ways in which it could not recognize uh, a protective order. And when I mean protective order, what I mean by that is a is an order from another jurisdiction which has the same effect as a deputyship order. Quite rare cases, and that and that's a good one. The, the second uh, area I wanted to look at, and this is another case where I was involved in acting for the official solicitor, is what role does the property and affairs deputy have in a welfare case where P wants to leave the jurisdiction? Um, uh, and this arose in a case called SP. Uh, litigation friend, the official solicitor against the London Borough of Hillingdon and S, um, 2003 EW uh, the COP COP 45. Um, and the facts are these, um, in, in short, that P was uh, a wealthy individual, previous owners, owner of banks internationally, and he had considerable assets in the UK and at some point had resided in this jurisdiction. Um, he had one child who lived in this jurisdiction and another who lived in the other, and he had resided with the other child for some time in the other jurisdiction. Um, the other child um, who lives in this country brought him to the United Kingdom at a stage when uh, there were real questions as to whether he had capacity um, because of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and dementia, and um, uh, made him, uh, it would seem, sign certain documents to create a limited uh, partnership, transferring certain assets that he held in this jurisdiction to the limited partnership for which she was a director. After doing that, in uh, and I'm really um, uh, fast forwarding the chronology, after doing that, he was then placed in a private care home, so his uh, needs being met uh, as a private funder, and the placement soon realized that this was an individual who lacked capacity. Uh, and so, and it, uh, in respect to residence and care, and obviously later transpired into property and affairs. And so a standard authorization was put in place in respect of his deprivation of liberty at the care home under Schedule A1. Um, there was real concerns raised as to whether um, his dementia um, was longstanding, and it was, uh, and the panel deputy was appointed in respect to his property and affairs, and after considerable investigation, they applied to set aside that corporate structure um, of a limited partnership and return the assets to his name and removing them from the director. Um, then ensued um, uh, uh, a, um, a welfare application um, under Section 21A, so when you review a deprivation of liberty and a placement, because he wanted to return home, because his um, articulated and very clear position was that I was only bought here because um, of undue influence and getting me to sign certain documents, and I want to return to the country of my origin. And so the question arose as to what role the deputy had in the welfare applications um, and a determination the court had to make as to whether it's in his best interest to return to his country of origin. Uh, and the court determined this, um, that the deputy has to be involved, um, not least because, number one in this case, there was an issue of conflict of interest, so uh, the deputy had to impart information to the judge as to whether there was a conflict of interest if P returned to the country of origin to live with his uh, other son, whether uh, he would properly look after him and whether there were safeguarding, financial safeguarding concerns. Um, that was one aspect. The second and fundamental aspect is that the deputy had to fund it. So he had to make a decision as to whether to fund a package of care uh, uh, to uh, for a person to for for P to go to the country, um, uh, had to make a decision as to whether the care agency that was suggested by Sun was adequate and provide sufficient safeguards. Had to make a decision in respect of the travel arrangements and so forth. And those decisions then led into the court and the local authorities subsequently making a de determination as to whether it's in his best interest because. If the deputy wasn't prepared to fund it, then it wasn't available option before the court and uh, go. There's there's no decision to be made, and he would be staying in the placement. 
Um, so, um, so there was a sense of um, uh, extreme stress given by the judge saying that the deputy's role was extremely important. The, the issue for the deputy, and quite rightly raised, was, well, these, listen, these are welfare considerations, and there's a thin line between what I'm supposed to do in terms of prop his property affairs and what are essentially quite complicated best interest welfare considerations. Um, but the court said this, in short, that summarizing um, uh, the law in, in a bit of detail, but, but summarized it to the extent that whilst he wasn't the deputy wasn't the final arbiter as to whether it's in his best interest, uh, what, uh, whether it was in his best interest to, re to return to his country of origin. He was a pers the important person to be consulted under Section 4 of the Act. And, uh, and the deputy, the court wanted the deputy to give an insight as to whether or not he thought the needs could be met, number one. Number two, whether there was sufficient oversight and whether it accorded with his wishes and feelings. So it's it's a good case which demonstrates, um, in my view, where property and affairs deputy entangled into welfare issues and the court asking a lot of information and a lot of uh, credence given to the opinion of the deputy in terms of best interest, number one, but fundamentally whether he, he uh, would fund a package of care in another jurisdiction. It's worth noting, finally, that there is some um, guidance out there from the then Vice President, Mr. Justice Hayden, two years ago during COVID and the restrictions in a case called UR 2021 EWCOP 10. And that was a purely welfare application where the court was determining whether or not uh, a, a, a P who was residing in a care home should return to, uh, uh, to Poland from where they were from. They wanted to go there. There was no involvement of the property and affairs deputy, but the court gave a list of issues which it thought was relevant to see in an application in order to make a best interest decision. Uh, and that would be interest um, documents such as fitness to fly, um, consideration as to whether their needs could be met in that other jurisdiction, uh, and also um, uh, whether there was sufficient oversight uh, and what the, um, what legal framework the jurisdiction had to provide the oversight to protect P. Those are the type of things that the court sought was important to see. But that's um, a bit of a sideline in terms of the guidance that courts provided uh, in relation to those types of applications. But to summarize this aspect or the final question that I that I, ra uh, I, I raised, which is what is the role of uh, uh, the property and affairs deputy in these types of applications, the answer is significant. Uh, and that case, I think, demonstrates that very, very clearly. Um, I, I've seen a few chats, um, questions about the citation. I think the citation's been given. Uh, whoever gave that, thank you very much for the first case. The second one, I'll check the citation because we're just waiting for the final citation with judgment just being handed down recently. So I'll check that and I'll get Katie, our, uh, our marketing manager, to circulate the citation once, once it's been confirmed. But those are the two cases that I really wanted to um, to, to give you an, uh, an overview about in terms of the cross-border management and the role of the property affairs deputy in welfare applications where he wants to leave the jurisdiction. Anybody wants to ask any further questions, then uh, please do feel free to email. But other than that, I suppose it's for Sam and I to say thank you very much for attending um, and we uh, look forward to welcoming you all to the next seminar in due course. Thanks very much.